and welcome to another episode of Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear. I'm your host, Mitch Ratcliffe, and we're back with another innovator interview. We're going to be talking about ESG, or Environmental, Social, and Governance Investing, and our ability to influence the direction our society is going as investors. You know, investors have immense influence that can reshape business practices, but it takes time and energy to understand how companies are making changes to reduce their environmental impact, create positive social outcomes, and improve transparency and accountability. Investors need more resources than ever to make good decisions. And our guest today, Zach Stein, is co-founder of Carbon Collective, a financial services firm that operates a robo-advisor guided set of environmental, social, and governance portfolios. They provide a range of approaches to investing from the cautious to the aggressive that aim to accelerate the arrival of the zero carbon economy. The Carbon Collective's basic approach suggests divesting from the roughly 20% of companies that are responsible for 85% of the emissions in the world, particularly fossil fuel companies, and then reallocate those investments to climate solution companies. The Carbon Collective tools are open to anyone to learn from, offering insights into companies based on project drawdowns analysis of their environmental and social performance. Carbon Collective also plans to launch managed exchange traded funds or ETFs focused on climate and social safety net companies in the future. You can find out more about Carbon Collective at carboncollective.co. Carbon Collective is one word, no dash, no space, carboncollective.co. Welcome to the show, Zach. How are you today? Mitch, I am so glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for that great summary. That was great. Well, thanks. We, you know, we try to get it right before we put you on the spot and ask you these questions. But let me ask you the hard question, and that is, are we really investing enough at this point to make this transition? McKinsey estimates that the world needs about $9.2 trillion a year put into zero carbon efforts over the next 30 years to get there. How are we doing? And what do we need to change? Uh, we're behind. This is why we, frankly, why we started Carbon Collective, mm -hmm. is that when we look at climate change, which to us, and I imagine your listeners, is the challenge of our time. And when we look at it, it's both an incredibly complex issue and a very simple one. And the simple answer is we do not avoid catastrophic climate change if we do not dramatically wind down investments in fossil fuels in the next 30 years and dramatically wind up investments into climate solutions. We have to invest our way into solving climate change. Well, and in fact, that also points out that this, like other energy transitions, and we've been through a few of them as a species, um, is an opportunity to grow and expand opportunity for everyone, but also potentially to create a lot of additional inequity. And, and an element of ESG investing is to think about equity or equitable outcomes, as well as simply think about changing the environmental impacts. Now, you're, you've spoken, we've talked in the past about this, and you, you said that your, your strategy is informed by factors outside of Wall Street. And this really, I think, gets to the nut of what drives your business. Are most banks and financial management firms too closely tied to the extractive carbon economy to make trustworthy, sustainable stock picks? Is that something we need to look past? At a high level, yes. Okay. I, I think that's fairly simple. Um, I'll use the example of BlackRock, who is you know far more than a bank, the largest asset holder in the world. Mm -hmm. Larry Fink, as you and your listeners might know, has been in a lot of ways the most forward for the big voices yeah. on Wall Street about climate being the existential crisis that it is, and saying that as investors, it needs to be factored into all types of investment decisions. They were feeling a lot of pressure from the left, from people like you and I. Um, it's in, especially that influencing that. Now BlackRock is, is getting pressure from the right. Um, with it, they, the Texas Teachers Fund has said to BlackRock and other states are doing this too now to say, hey, you got to cut this fossil fuel divestment talk or we're going to find a new asset manager. And so BlackRock is now caught in the middle of having this foot in the old world and talking about the new world, but not really able to take a clear line in both. And it's meaning that they're just hmm. not pleasing anyone. I think in the world of investing, and I think we're seeing this broadly around the world, it is harder to remain neutral. You increasingly need to be, you, you, you're either for or against, and especially when it comes to climate. And this is part of our goal at Carbon Collective. As I said, the path to solving climate change is in some ways very simple. Any 
investing strategy that is not aligned with that, to us, it's really hard to label that as sustainable. So BlackRock's a good example of, of how the market is a contest of conflicting opinions, and they are caught in the middle of that. But of course, we're still talking about a range of information that investors have available to them. So how would you suggest they use your information to augment the financial information they're getting from companies and analysts uh, on Wall Street? Yeah, Wall Street and what we've seen is just still not very good at thinking about climate change and what is coming. And this just partially operates. Um, it's on a 90 day cycle. So much of the news is, you know, Jim Cramer, bye, 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 uh, making that market commentary. What's happening in the treasuries market? How is, you know, the crisis in the Ukraine going to impact things? It is not taking a long term approach. And climate change is a, you know, long term problem. It's, it's here and it's coming. We're seeing it. But it's not sudden, and so it doesn't drive the news cycle in the same way. With our approach, especially in how we build our collection of climate solutions funds, what we are trying to do is use only publicly available data. This is a problem that we actually have with ESG. Um, if I could take a sec maybe to describe sure. the ESG framework in general. So ESG was built for institutional investors. It was built by analytics companies who these institutional investors like big pensions funds knew really well because they built indices and they would come, they came and say, Hey, we have all this really interesting data on these companies. You want to be more ethical. Can we sell you that data and you can mm -hmm. build more ethical or at least less bad portfolios with it. And for them, they especially tried to sell it that it was more risk aligned um, for around ethical issues. Right. Wall Street thought that be really successful with institutional investors. They were like, oh, retail investors like you and me will like this a lot too. And it has been very popular, but part of us in understanding should a, does a carbon collective need to exist was that it actually does not meet the needs of you and I, mm -hmm. because it is by its basis, it, it is not transparent. The, those data companies, they aren't going to give away the data for free. That's how they make their money. You don't give away the cow for free. And so, you know, you have to pay $30,000 a year to get access to it. Um, that doesn't create trust. You don't actually get to see how MSCI, the company that builds Vanguard's ESG funds, how they make all those decisions of what goes in there or what doesn't. You're basically right. saying, just trust me. And you've probably never heard of MSCI. And so that's part of our goal in what we're building is we want you to be able to understand exactly why everything is in there. And to do that, we, especially for our climate solutions companies, there's so much talk in the space of climate change. There's so much about pledges, 2030, 2040, mm -hmm. 2050, et cetera. We only use last year's revenue as the leading guide because to us, action speaks so much louder than words mm -hmm. of where, where is a company actually investing their money and headed um, with it. And so we think that to us, that's at least been a, a more helpful framework than kind of relying upon companies' vague goals. Well, tell us about the process of, of determining what goes into your various portfolios. You, you know, you have a combination of some uh, machine screening information, but it's largely human-powered indexing based on the thesis that we can change, and you have diversified within various sectors and by market cap. What does that mean to the individual investor who is looking for advice? Yeah. So when we started Carbon Collective, we wanted to build portfolios where you as an individual didn't feel like you had to sacrifice in order to invest in a way that was aligned with your values or at least your theses about how the world was going to change over the coming years, especially in relation to climate change. So that means that it had to be broadly diversified, especially our core portfolios, had a similar risk and reward profile that you'd be getting in a standard index based portfolio that's doing no screening whatsoever and have similar fees. And so we looked at the entire stock market, 100% mm -hmm. of it, and you talked about this in our introduction, and found that about 20% of it were made of companies who are technologically dependent on the use of fossil fuels for their core business. So, so what are those them, industries? What, what kind of industries are you describing when you, you say that? Oil is a very obvious one. Yeah. Oil, natural gas, and coal. Um Airlines, airline manufacturers, you know, we can talk about uh, sustainable aviation fuels, but still it, it is a long, long way in the distance. Petrochemical companies, cement, steel, a lot of industrial companies, major shipping companies. Um, these, are, they are just technologies that in the world that we decarbonize, either the replacement is still on the lab bench 
or these companies will fundamentally need to change their core business if they are going to exist in that world. So we take it, I want to flag that we should talk about the divest versus engage argument. It, well, let's, it is let's do that now, because I think that's, okay. a, that's a good time to have the conversation, because clearly Perfect. you don't want to invest in a fossil fuel company. That's just giving them fuel for more pollution. But how do you how do you make that assessment? And particularly, how do you tease apart the, the interconnection between so many companies and the underlying energy platform that we're on now, fossil fuels, in order to, 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 to identify those really carbon positive companies? Yeah, so we the way that we look at it, we, we again try to zoom all the way out mm -hmm. and say, can this company's core business or could this sector's core business exist with, with the technology that we have today without some major breakthrough in the lab um, in a decarbonized world, in the world mm -hmm. where we reach net zero? And most of the stock market can. And the example I often use is Coca-Cola. So okay. Coca-Cola, not an environmentally friendly company. For you know all of us who've tracked them, they treat their watersheds really poorly. You know mm -hmm. a ton of plastic that is used. You know lo lots of kind of uh, egregious things around the world. When we think about what what is the world what that looks like when we solve climate change, there's no reason why Coke couldn't sell me a brown sugary bubbly beverage that uses the secret recipe. Mm -hmm. Nothing is stopping that today. It just would be powered with 100% renewable energy. Mm -hmm. and delivered on a 100% electrified fleet. Ideally, we'd pressure them to change and steward their waterships instead of abuse them, and ideally change how they're spending their lobbying dollars. That to us means that, okay, this company, because it is, again, you talk, described your listeners as pragmatic. To us, that is the pragmatism here. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that this company's core business is not going to change, which means that it is upon us as investors, this is where we should engage especially for a company like Coke that sees me as a consumer and us right. collectively as consumers, we can have additional power there. So it's upon us to get them to decarbonize their business as quickly as possible, because we're not saying change your business. We're just saying change how it's powered. And that's a much easier ask than going to an oil company and saying, ExxonMobil, please become a solar company. Well, so once a company is added to a portfolio, how does the carbon collective work to influence them or is it a matter of marshalling the individual investors and helping them influence them yeah so there's a few ways i think this is where you let me maybe take a step back from your question okay or maybe i'll repose it which is when you're buying stocks on the stock market you're buying used stocks the stock market is like ebay <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not, you're not, this is not a new issue. It's from the company. And so there's this question of, all right, what is the actual impact of that? And I think that's a really important question is especially for people who say like, oh, well, sustainable investing doesn't matter because it, it's all just used. I should just invest with the market with as low fees as possible and move on. Um, there's a few ways that we have influence with this that are really critical. One is voting. Mm -hmm. When you own a share in a company, you, it is a weird form of democracy, but you have power. In it. And we've seen some recent examples of that being used very effectively. So um, do, you, do you use the site to educate investors to, to vote in the direction that would help the company move into post-carbon operations? So our voting strategy is on a few ways. We believe that the vast majority of people do not have the time nor the attention span to vote on the countless issues that come up in proxy voting. We have that availability and most people say, why am I getting so many of these emails? Yeah. <laughs> and so we take on that responsibility. Um, we vote in coalition with a number of groups like As You So, which is a Berkeley-based nonprofit um, mm -hmm. focused on proxy share voting for most issues. And then we make very specific decisions on climate ones. Part of our goal at Carbon Collective is to build ourselves to a point where we're able to also put forth our own shareholder resolutions. This is, again, in our theory of change, which is w the types of companies that we should be engaging with is not the Exxon Mobiles of the world. That's why part of the reason why we divest from them. We do not mm -hmm. believe that engagement with them will have any tangible climate impact because we should focusing on reducing supply when there is still demand for fossil fuels will not be effective. To us, we need to reduce the demand for fossil fuels, which is going to those companies who could switch getting them to switch as quickly as possible. So for example, we're seeing this a lot with the, um, the major uh, superstores like Walmart and Target. 
why don't they have solar panels on every single one of their superstores? That would not only you know save the money over time, also offer climate resilience um, in times of uh, uh, great instability, higher gas prices, et cetera, it could be much smarter from a business perspective. That is the type of shareholder resolution that we want to be on the forefront of and pushing for um, with our ownership and how we're using it. So that is our plan for how we're leveraging our shares. There's also a, uh, when you are, when you own a stock, and especially when you own it in a retirement fund, you often don't move it, you don't sell it. Yeah, and so yeah. until it just sits there. So you are actively reducing the supply of that company's shares on the actively traded market. And that means that when that company has a really good quarter, the lower supply of shares that are being actively traded means that the demand will go up, that com the price of those companies' share will go up, which will lower its cost of capital. It can get cheaper loans from a bank and it will get, it could sell additional stock more cheaply. We've seen Tesla do this. We've seen Plug Power. We've seen a lot in the recent kind of green energy boom. Companies be able to do this to be able to aggressively expand. And that's when we talked about that, that climate gap where McKinsey said it's $9 trillion a year needed. Drawdown um, says it's a $5 trillion a year needed. Right. You know, it's the ballpark range that we're in, these gigantic numbers. <laughs> yeah, the $4 trillion ballpark. Yeah. So that's exactly, we need every tool. When, when it comes to climate, it's what we always try to push for is that uh, we can't have no but. We need mm -hmm. to have yes ands. And the type of things, especially for what we, we like to say to individuals is what are the big things in your life that you can pick up as a decision, look at it from all different angles, make a really informed decision, and then you get to put it down. You don't have to think about it every day afterwards. So this is where's your money? How are you powering your house? How are you getting to work? These kind of really big decisions there that once you do it, you're just turning the lights on mm -hmm. afterwards and you don't have to think about it. Yeah, the, the habit changes and then you have a new habit. Uh, we, we simply need to educate more people on what, the possibilities are rather than telling them what they must do. This that's also, you know, that is one of the things about the market is you have to choose your way into the direction you, you want to go. So let me ask you about the climate index, which is a really useful yeah. tool. Uh, and I want to ask about a particular stock. So you use yeah. the project drawdown information as a source for this, this guidance. And you summarize a yeah. company's impact, describe the company's strategy, and suggest improvements they can make. So here's a company that I wanted to ask about, STEM Incorporated. It's an AI, artificial intelligence solution for energy industry companies to, to optimize their systems. They don't report their GHG emissions and they haven't set any emissions goals, which feels like they're not really well aligned with the direction, except that they optimize energy performance. So do you recommend waiting to invest in a company like STEM Inc. until they do take those steps? Or do you get in and suggest they take those steps? It's a really uh, informed question. I, I want to clarify one thing. We use Project Drawdown as an independent source right. to define what is a climate solution category. So they are involved in any of the filtering or anything like Understood. this. I like to make this very clear if anyone from Drawdown is listening. They are just independent. They have published it, and we've just used that resource. Okay. Um, so with a company like STEM, and this is where it gets into that really interesting question of to divest or engage, um, they are building a climate solution. Mm -hmm. um, in that they are, it, energy efficiency is really important, especially electrical energy efficiency is really important. We are going to be, the world where we solve climate change, we use a lot more electricity than we do today, which means that we need to use that electricity as efficiently as possible. So to us, we see inclusion of these companies, and there are companies who, it, it, it's the climate index and that selection of companies, we are not saying that these are all perfect companies. Okay. When it comes to climate, what we, you know, we are can't saying, let the perfect be the enemy of progress in this case, because we de desperately need to make these steps. But to, exactly to, 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 to kind of drill down on the question just a little more. Nevertheless, the company hasn't taken the steps that you would expect a company that will embrace transparency and accountability to take. Do I invest and say you need to do that or should I wait for them to do it and communicate to them I'm waiting? So our strategy is very much the first one. Okay. Of we invest, and this is where we take that seat at the table, and we engage, and we say, hey, we want to be partners with you here. Um, we need to make sure we're tracking this. And this gets to an interesting point. It's something I, I know we want to talk about the SEC's new rules. Mm -hmm. And 
I've just, this is more like my personal thought, just a, a kind of a thread I've been exploring, which is, are we in the climate space? Are we losing the forest? for the trees mm -hmm. when it comes to carbon tracking and all of this valid question because it, to some degree we just we know what companies need to do and it's almost it's like it's like the house all the taps are on or there's a pipe leaking and we're mm -hmm. saying all right well before we can do anything let's measure exactly how much water is coming out of the pipe that's leaking <laughs> instead of being like no we, this company needs 100% renewable energy and it needs to electrify its fleet and we need and you know it needs to work with suppliers that are do, have done the same um, in what they're doing so yeah I, i'd honestly be interested in your thoughts in some degree of are we letting the measurement be the other side of the argument is you can't fix what you can't measure right well and and and, and, and i would actually start from there and say that unless you measure you, you really aren't going to make any progress. However, on the other hand, if you get stuck in the measurements without understanding the context of the measurements, and, and so a phrase that I will frequently use is transparency isn't a set of data, it's a narrative. Mm -hmm. You need the context, what that ESG measurement means in the bigger picture in order for there to be a, an actionable decision to make. And, and let's talk a little about the Securities and Exchange Commission's recent decision to require uh, disclosure, detailed disclosure of GHG emissions and climate risk uh, impacts on a business. Is that going to, you know, sort of shine light in, in an, an area where we have not had any visibility? Or is it is it potentially a way of getting bogged down in more data like you just asked? Yeah. So this proposal is pretty exciting in a lot of ways. I think that there is a facing of what is coming that it could lead to. There's ways that it couldn't. I think that there's ways of getting bogged down in the data. There's ways in which it could continue to be a delay tactic uh, against yeah. change um, with that. It's like, oh, well, we need to fully measure it first before we can really know what needs to change. Whereas like the low hanging fruit is gonna be the same regardless of how well it's measured or not. Um, so I think that there is a lot of potential with this uh, this ruling and, and what mm -hmm. could come down from it. It is not in stone yet. It, it is still a, very much a proposal. Sure. Um, but I think it's, a, it's also an acknowledgement that climate change of when we look at the range of ESG issues, it is a category of its own. Mm -hmm. It is a level of impending upset to our entire global system um, that is just different. And so that's part of, again, why in Starting Carbon Collective, we aren't ESG, it's climate. Um, well, and, that and, and that's an important on. point, I, a, a very important point that, you know, we are, we can't actually imagine the scope of the impacts that we are bringing down on ourselves, uh, unless we're scientists and can take that data and turn it into a good story in our heads. Yes. How, well, let me, let me pivot just a bit and, and, and say, and ask this question then, are there a few companies that people should look at that you, they would be surprised by? that could help make a difference? What are they? That's a very interesting question. It's honestly, and this is sometimes I get pushed to, you know, name individual stocks mm -hmm. and things like that. And that's just, it's not in our ethos, our carbon collective. I'm not suggesting you okay. make a pick, but okay. are there companies that you said to yourself as you looked at them, wow, I didn't think they got it, but they get it more than I mm -hmm. thought. Hmm. Yeah, there's, it's interesting. There are companies like, you know, Philips. Mm -hmm. um, they were on our climate index two years ago. They ended up cutting that business line, their LED business, mm -hmm. but they're already carbon neutral in how they operate. And that was really interesting to see. Again, that's not, that's not data that we use in our filtering, right. um, but it was inspiring. And we think that there's a lot more of how do we dig into how such a large company who operates on such a, a range of supply chains was mm -hmm. able to achieve scope one and two carbon neutrality. And, and how does that set the road for the rest? I think another company that is not a company that we invest in, but we really look to as a strong example of an energy company is Orsted. Mm -hmm. um, you are probably familiar with them. They were a major oil producer in Europe and they made the very conscious decision to divest all of their assets right. and get into the wind energy business and have done really well since doing so. 
And we need to see a lot more Orsteds. When we think about how that's actually going to happen, in some ways, the way Orsted was able to do it is it wasn't one of the major players. It was a mid-tier player. So it was able to sell those assets into a hot market that still wanted to buy them. If Exxon is saying, hey, the oil business is a bad business, it would actually undercut its own ability to sell those assets. So yeah. there's a really interesting space of who can make that transition more easily and what is going to be that order of operations there. This is why to us at Carbon Collective, it's why we need to focus on demand. We have to make oil a bad business by reducing its demand, and only then will you get the oil majors to follow. Interesting, though, that you're, you're also calling out the fact that in a sense they're stuck. And, and how do we create an incentive to get unstuck? Yes. Yes, exactly. And that takes pressure from all sides. I think that mm -hmm. there can be, um, again, this is to the yes andism um, of, of what it's going to take to solve climate change, which is it takes the people who work internally at oil companies to say that, hey, this is just not the wrong direction business-wise for us to go right. in. Because we can feel all that external pressure, but, that are, but if there's not internal guides or Yodas who are there saying, this is the path forward, Mm -hmm. of where we can go. And it's not just, you know, in response to like, you know, the uh, greed, but it's actually the smart business decision. That is also how that change will happen, but it's only going to happen in response to projected demand. Um, well, and that's, but that's a line very line. uncomfortable place to be in a company. Yes. Uh, having been in the senior level of a number of large organizations, being the, the, uh, the Cassandra in this case is dangerous to a career. Let me, uh, so let's give them some help. How can our yeah. listeners get involved on Carbon Collective and use your information to give those Cassandras some support? Mm, I love that. So there's a few ways that you can make change, and especially uh, when it comes to investing. One is to shift your own investments. It matters. Um, your IRA, your old 401k, where it is matters. Um, so that that is the first thing. Take you know just a, a step you know a, and and make that shift. Whether it's with Carbon Collective or with someone else, um, uh, how can you get that aligned with mm -hmm. what we actually need to do to solve climate change? The second thing is to talk about it. There is this pervasive narrative, and this is the third way of impact, um, that to invest sustainably is to accept a percentage point or two lower returns. And that is, I, we, I still feel it all the time. People say, I'm going to join, yeah, I'm, I'm with you guys, and you know, I know I'm going to get lower returns, and that's okay. I'm like, no. Although you're talking about a buy and hold strategy for the most part, based on our conversation, yes. whereas a lot of people Correct. get that extra one or two percent out of trying to time the market or thinking they're smarter than everybody else. And it doesn't work out that often. No, no. The uh, data will prove has proven this over and over again. The buy and hold, don't make a change, set and forget a monthly deposit is the best way for investors like you and me who have a lot of things going on in our life yeah. to make money uh, over the long term and build wealth in, in the stock market. Um, and so that is very much the approach that we are trying to align with. Um, there's like the, that counter narrative that fossil fuels are an important part of a balanced portfolio, which since the year I was born, 1989, has mm -hmm. not been true. It, if you had divested from the S&P 500 from fossil fuels in that year, up until today, you would have made more money. Yeah. In that time, and that includes the 2000s, where that the fossil fossil fuel in, uh, index was three times higher. It had a 300 percent return over that decade, where the S and P 500 was flat. So it includes the time of countercyclical. It still, it would have done uh, significantly worse over this time period. And, and the interesting thing is that climate change was only really identified in the late 80s uh, publicly. It, it, clearly, it was discovered many years, uh, centuries earlier. But you're, you're hitting on an important point again, which is that we have been stuck in a relationship with fossil fuels that we can break out of. And in fact, there's evidence that we already are starting to separate. And this only changes when the narrative itself changes. The, like Narratives build self-fulfilling prophecies mm -hmm. with this. And so the narrative that fossil fuels is a smart investment helps make fossil fuels, it helps prop it up. Yeah. Um, and, and keep that going. And so that's where that talk about it. And then the third piece is don't settle for less. The world of ESG and so much in this space is saying, well, let's really ground in the now and mm -hmm. say, you know, what is what is the the most possible we could expect for today? And, and that's just not how the world changes. We yeah. need people 
to, to say and hold, no, this is how the world should be. And that, I, I've thought about this a lot. I don't know a way that the world changes until enough individuals collectively say the same thing and demand the same thing of, of that change. And so don't, you know, don't be quiet, whether it's at work and you're saying to your HR manager, our 401k program needs to have options that align with the climate transition, your pension fund, your individual investing in your family, wh wherever that be, um, don't settle for less. Because that's if, if you do, that's skipping in and we just don't have time for that. Zach, I think that's a great place to stop this conversation. And I hope you'll come back and talk with us again. But uh, great, great thinking there at the end. And, and uh, folks, go check out Carbon Collective at carboncollective.co. Carbon Collective has no dash, no space. Uh, Zach, come back soon. Mitch, it was so great to be here. I look forward to more good questions. Have a good one. We've been talking with Zach Stein. He's the co-founder of Carbon Collective, a financial services firm that provides a wide range of information about the companies uh, that they're investing in and they suggest you consider avoiding and putting your money into. And, and once again, we've heard how much influence each of us can have. We have plenty of tools available. In fact, we have more tools than any other generation in human history. But we need to change our personal narrative in order to create and project the world we want to the rest of society so that we can all negotiate our way towards an equitable outcome to the climate crisis, one in which we end global warming and give everybody who needs the opportunity to succeed and to contribute to society uh, a door to participate in everybody's lives. This is Earth 911, sustainability in your ear. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe, and we're going to be back, of course, with another innovator interview soon. But in the meantime, take a few minutes to share this podcast and all the others that we've done uh, with your friends, your family, your coworkers. Send a link to your boss and get them to think about what their business decisions do to your corporate reputation. Let's get this conversation going. More ideas is going to create less waste, and it's going to make a sustainable society. We'll be back soon. In the meantime, folks, take care of yourself, take care of one another, and let's all take care of this beautiful planet of ours. Have a green day.